obviously it hasn't been one that has enhanced the social cohesion of, of Lebanon. I, just walking to the Carnegie Center, I passed the billboard that had graffiti written on it that said Majlis al-Harami or Majlis Harami. Um, and, you know, it's obviously been an, in, a site of incredible uh, contestation within the country. And I think it is fair to say that many of the contemporary problems that Beirut faces in terms of, or, and Lebanon as a whole, in terms of waste management, um, infrastructure failures, mobility, in terms of congestion, urban governance issues, and with the rise of, you know, the uh, Use Stink campaign and things like Beirut Medinity, um, you know, the, a lot of those center on many of the issues and, and way in which the, the reconstruction was formulated um, and undertaken. The vast accumulation of debt, the fact that it really focused on the downtown area um, and committed huge resources to a very small space and the construction of large highways from the downtown directly to the airport, for instance. The airport itself, um, it, it exacerbated uh, already existing inequalities um, and created uh, enormous um, social tensions in a context that was obviously recovering from what was a brutal civil war. Um, and my paper that I've uh, come to discuss with you at Carnegie is also trying to think about uh, reconstruction in a, in a more expansive way and really maybe get away from um, our existing ideas of, of what it means. Um, and one of the things that I point out is that construction itself is a very violent process. Um, and one, of course, that is intertwined with all sorts of political, economic and social interests. You know, where you construct a highway has profound economic and social consequences. Um, and indeed, it, during the Civil War, you know, much of the destruction of downtown, as documented by people like Asim Salam, showed that it was actually during cleanup operations, so-called cleanup operations, and not through open conflict. Um, so in, in my paper, I actually traced the reconstruction uh, that happened after the Taif Agreement through the Civil War. Um, you know, there were two major attempts to reconstruct um, during the civil war, as you know, there, there were it wasn't a continuous civil war. It was made up of many different battles, and as early as 1977, um, the first reconstruction was attempted that actually set the foundations for the idea of um, uh, several real estate companies to reconstruct the, the uh, or parts of um, the Beirut area and also set the foundation for the CDR, the Council for Development and Reconstruction, that would become um, integral to the formation and construction of, of uh, various infrastructure in, uh, after the, the Taif Agreement. So, you know, the, the reconstruction was very much embedded um, in the processes of the Civil War. There wasn't this clean break um, in 91 of a uh, post-Civil War era, if you like. Um, certainly a certain types of direct conflict ended, but definitely the, the reconstruction was entangled in, in certain other conflicts that were, were played out. Um, and consulting newly released um, documents by the World Bank, you know, I also see from those discussions that they had very on, early on in the reconstruction, um, that there was no uh, desire or and they even say there was no political ability, for instance, to create a social safety net um, because of the, the basically the continued fighting in the in the country. But maybe didn't result in open conflict, although it did at times. Was mainly done through the various distribution of uh, compensation for people displaced uh, through the construction of roads and buildings. Um, and so, yeah, the, the Reconstruction was very much embedded in the sediments of, of the Civil War. I think 
this is a very important question in that many of the, especially contemporary arguments um, in favour of, of Solidaire and the Hariri project is that at least he had a plan. There was Horizon 2000 that um, the Virtual Corporation established with DA, um, and indeed Hariri did work very quickly and very fastidiously to, to really um, get this vision in material terms so people could see it. But it's also important to highlight that there were people that formulated alternative visions and did outline um, problems with the, with the reconstruction that Hariri was outlining, most notably a book called Beirut, Constructing the Future, Reconstructing the Past by um, a group of Lebanese intelligentsia uh, that included people like Nabil Behum, Jeb Tabit, um, Kamal Hamdan, Asim Salam, that, that really did work and, and showed, you know, the, pro the, the problems with the privatisation um, scheme that Hariri was, was talking about. And it's important to note, I mean, Kamal Hamdan told me that once that book came out, Hariri bought every single copy and made sure it didn't hit the shelves and that those alternative voices were, were silenced. And as we know, you know, Solidaire um, and Hariri himself did an enormous array of publications of information to, to really make that vision hegemonic so that there weren't alternatives. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be as so um, confident as to suggest my own alternatives. My, my main point is that there, there were alternatives, there were critiques, and indeed they did successfully change the reconstruction plan to a certain extent. I mean, the original plan that Hariri proposed was known as the uh, Ede plan, the Omre Ede, the notable Lebanese arch um, architect, formulated, which was not a good plan. Um, and the Lebanese um, architects and intellectuals mobilised and then indeed it, it did get changed drastically and we have more or less uh, what we see today which is no doubt far better than the edit, edit plan. As the critiques at the time said it took no um, it took no consideration of the historical urban fabric even though there was vast destruction here by Auger Liban um, as Asim, Asim Salam has uh, detailed, uh, there, there is still, this is still an incredibly, it still was an incredibly rich site. It wasn't the tabula rasa that, um, mm. that was kind of proposed. And um, these, they, there was a kind of World Trade Center that was proposed that was um, these huge towers. There was going to be a huge highway uh, that was basically going to cut the, the heart of, of Beirut. It wasn't sensitive to to the context in, and not only the context, to the sort of built environment that makes um, a, a good city. And, you know, technically, Solidaire is a sophisticated project. Mm. Um, you know, people, the people that worked on it, um, people like Angus Gavin, they drew on um, the ideas of Kevin Lynch and so the pedestrianised areas of images of the city, um, yeah, the ideas of Kevin Lynch and uh, the sorts of high caliber architects, Al although unfortunately they did uh, not draw enough on the highly sophisticated existing Lebanese um, resources and, and sort of architectural practices. They always had to act as junior partners. Um, for the most part, to big star architects, which I do think was a mistake. But nevertheless, technically, Solidaire is no doubt a highly sophisticated project. Um, but there is no social element to that. Solidaire is a social failure. I don't think that that is a controversial <laughs> statement. I mean, you can just go out and look today. And it, it did work in, in a, a few years, but if you don't build those social foundations with um, the master plans that were created and, and the kind of architectural techniques that were deployed, then you do get um, the, the kind of results that we see. I'm not an expert on Syria. Um, I don't have the knowledge of that context like I do of the Lebanese one. Um, 
but I would venture to say there are three fundamental differences. One is obviously the geopolitical. Um, you know, the, although the Taif Accord didn't mention Solidaire uh, or really go into the reconstruction, there was a very clear agreement um, between the Saudis, the Americans and the Syrians as to the more or less the type of reconstruction that would follow and that Hariri would look after the economic aspects and um, and the, lead the reconstruction. And those sorts of geopolitical contexts are obviously vastly different um, for the context of, of Syria. So, you know, you're not going to have the types of corporation, the same sorts of corporations like Betchel, um come in uh, to Syria and formulate those sort of plans. It's obviously going to have a heavy Russian and Chinese um, involvement, which is going to be very, very different from here. The, um, the Americans and Saudis, I imagine, will have very little say in terms of, of what goes on. So that's one fundamental difference. Um, two, although Solidaire obviously didn't have the vast influx of capital from abroad that was necessarily expected or intended. Um, nevertheless, it's still relatively open uh, economy. So at least from the diaspora and a certain amount of Gulf money has flowed through this place. Uh, obviously, Syrians have been displaced throughout uh, the world. How they engage um, or not will, will be seen in terms of, yeah, I imagine you won't see this sort of vast inflows of capital that from from the diaspora. So that will obviously um, change it immensely. And, and the types of what's been called neoliberal um, model, certainly I would have thought will not will not be followed um, in trying to attract that sort of foreign investment. It will be to a, to a relative extent, a lot more uh, closed off than, than that. And, and thirdly, I would have thought that, you know, the Lebanon reconstruction was focused on the downtown area and Beirut. In Syria, you've got a, a larger scale um, destruction in terms of it spread across many different cities. Um, that each have their own intricacies and political, economic and social formations uh, that will uh, dictate the sorts of um, plans that, that could be uh, formulated. But there's no doubt um, it will be a lot less open and a lot more centralised than the Lebanese example. Mm -hmm.